Hello, Michael Veach here. We have our open fire. We have our lovely glass of Wayward Child wine from Helen and Joey. Delicious, thank you very much. We have a book of short stories. It must therefore be Sunday afternoon short story reading time. All this month I've been reading a short story from the authors that are going to be featuring in our next week's uh, Sunday session, Why Short Stories Make a Big Impact. It's going to be a great session featuring authors Alice Bishop, Sean O'Byrne, Josephine Rowe, and uh, the convener will be Alice Cottrell from Kill Your Darlings. Um, Josephine Rowe is a former winner of the Herald Sun, Young, young, um, uh, uh, young Australian Novelist of the Year. Uh, this is her latest collection of short stories here until August. I'm going to read for you now, Sinkers. Enjoy. At 33, he goes back to the town his mother was raised in. She'd taken him there as a child every summer for her own birthday, and they'd rode out in a hired tinny to eat a picnic above the place she believed her house must have been, must still be. The doorstep, at least, which had been made of concrete, and maybe the skeleton of the house itself, many years drowned, its a brick chimney home to nests of eels and whirls of trout. I was born down there, she'd tell him again and again, between mouthfuls of egg sandwich and swigs of portello. And when I was 14, the hydroelectric came, so we all had to leave. He'd looked out over the side of the little boat, into the green depths, and imagined his mother being hauled up out of them, reeled like a fish to the surface, into the dry, boring world, gleaming and furious and fighting the air. He imagined his father was down there too, though likely the man had never seen the town or even the lake that had swallowed it. Still, he was somehow, somehow there, doing father things, tending to the lake weeds instead of lawn, shaving his jaw, leaning over the underwater sink to stare at his reflection in the underwater mirror, his features made bleary by the grey-green murk of the government-ordained lake. Christian had never known his father's face not even the picture of it. His mother had never tried to chase this stranger down, knew he wouldn't have stayed in any case. It didn't matter, she said. She had, she had everything she needed. Does he even know about me? Cricket, how could he? There was no truth she meant to protect him from. Look, kiddo, other people are going to lie to you, and some are going to do it out of what they think is kindness. Not me, though. I'm never going to. You might as well get used to it. At the boat hire, Christian buys three hours from the man who has run the shed for the past two decades and likely before. Christian recalls seeing him there all through the 90s, hair a little less wild, a little less white, bringing the boats in or directing them out, otherwise leaning in the shaded door of the hire shed, perpetually in the act of rolling a cigarette he never seemed to get around to smoking. He's doing so now, licking the gummed edge and letting it hang on his lip, unlit, a thin cocoon dangling from a ledge. He lumbers across the dock, looks down at Christian's suede oxfords, up at his stiff collared shirt, just got out of church, and leads him to a silver tinny, unhitching it with a, in you get. Christian knows he's thinking tourist, with that curdled feeling of contempt and relief. It's mostly tourists who hire, tourists who bring in money. On the jetty, two children squat to stare into the buckets of live bait while their father threads their hand reels, socking hooks with worm flesh as he explains about the bells. It's a story Christian has overheard many times before, that if you stick your head under the water at just the right hour of day, you'll hear the old church bells ringing. His mother had, had had no patience for that sort of thing. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. The church was shifted out along with everything else. Stick your head under the water, she used to say, and all you're going to hear is your ears getting wet. She told him other stories, better stories, what she called the true provost stories, of how the new town appeared to remember the old, and over the years had inched down the mountainside, trying to sneak back to it of weekends spent watching boys free dive the, down, the drowned town, rowing out with rocks they'd use as sinkers, 
tipping over the sides with them hugged tight to their chests so they'd reach the bottom fast and easy, wouldn't waste any breath getting down there. It gave them longer to look around, she said. Look around for what? Oh, they just wanted to see for themselves. They wanted to get deep long enough to look in the windows of the houses that got left behind, like there were people still down there living watery ghost lives or something, sitting down to breakfast at the table like normal, but when you pour out the cereal it just goes everywhere like fish food. That's what they wanted to see, things like that. Christian unlaces his shoes and peels his damp socks from his feet, shins white from the Sydney winter, from too many months lived under office fluorescence. He has brought no food, no water, just the old biscuit tin and its sifting contents. He stows it on one of the slat seats, rosellas and gum blossoms encircling the rim, glinting, a bright day for August. Still the dark will come early, sun already stippled through gum branches. He pushes off from the jetty with outstretched arms, oars slipping in the locks. The boatman, peering from his shade, shaking his head and muttering something under his breath, paper pusher or yuppie poofter, though without much in the way of vitriol, finally turning away. No wind in the valley, the lake doubling everything faithfully, bathysphere, ghost gums twinned from their roots, branching towards alternate skies, nothing to trouble that second world but the wakes of a few wading birds, and that of himself dipping the oar blades towards their reflections without much rhythm or effect. He is no good with the oars, no good with his arms. The children's voices are still clear and his palms already hot. His mother, out there on the water, she'd looked glamorous. Even rowing, her forehead creased with the effort of sawing the oars back and forth and the humidity pressing her fine, flat hair. Her dress would be tucked up to keep it from the slimy water sloshing the bottom of the boat. The end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, somehow she'd escaped that era's synthetic epidemic, dressing always in linen, pale silk, soft things that would crease and show stains if you were that kind of person. She was not. Crimpoline's just another word for lazy, she said, as if she had any idea what crimpoline was. Sometimes she'd rode, out, she'd rode them out over the house where a man had maybe killed his wife and child, or maybe not. It had been a talky sort of town, she said, and that talk just seemed to increase with the altitude after the relocation. The town had been flooded the year after the girl and her mother were found dead in their kitchen. No one ever said how. Too awful was the only answer the parents would give. Too awful to talk about. Perhaps because they did not really know and the rumours were outrageous and conflicting something about poison but whose fault and maybe an accident after all most people's houses were trucked out of the valley up the side of the mountain but that house was either too rickety or too sad and it stayed where it was the roof tiles were salvaged but the rest was left to the flood christian's mother's house got left behind as well feasted on by white hands to which christian's grandfather had been happy enough to surrender a three-year battle, knowing the termites' mingy victory would be short-lived. It was the other house, the roofless, too awful to talk about house that the boys were diving to, hugging stones to their chests all those years ago. Sometimes they'd surface with things held between their teeth or tucked into the pockets and belt loops of their cut-down denims, things they called evidence, rusted cutlery, a brown glass bottle, medicinal or sinister. Someone said that if you pulled up the waterlogged floorboards, you'd find... What? Proof? Of what? You know, how he... You know. And when they couldn't bring back proof, they'd surface with stories. Something down there. Something grabbed me. Swam past two shadows in the doorway. Swear it then. I swear! She'd known the daughter, of course, Emily. Hair short and soft and black as cat's fur, and her teeth, when she laughed, were like a cat's, small and sharp. 
The two had clattered over the town's corrugated dirt streets on boys' bicycles, tearing pages out of great-grandmother's leather-bound King James and daring each other to eat them. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the sound of the bird. Was that it? His mother had shivered out there above the town. M said Ecclesiastes tasted best. He has come with no water, no food, an ache in his fillings for the store-bought cake his mother took out to the lake each year. Fake cream, icing shiny and hard like a beetle's back. Nothing close to what she could have made herself, but she thought it bad luck for a person to bake their own birthday cake, and his efforts would have to be a clotted mess. They would take their sandwich crusts and empty drink bottles home with them, but they'd crumble up some of the cake and scatter it over the side like rice at a wedding, watch the white sugary sponge dissolve into the lake water, splashing away any fish or ducks who tried to paddle in and eat it. Not for you, not for you. This is what he remembers, looking towards the smooth trunks of ghost gums at the lake's edge, hoping for something familiar, something that might act as a point of reference. There is no such thing. Even the boat shed is gone from sight, and there is nothing to indicate whether or not this is the right place. The lake tells him little, dumbly reflecting back the, de the deepening sky. Christian takes the lid from the biscuit tin, sees the powder and bone gravel, and cannot do it. He gives himself a minute to recover his nerve, thinks he could maybe drop the entire tin over the side, but this is worse somehow. He can't explain it, even to himself, like burying someone alive. Cricket, can you just do as you're asked? But alone on the lake he feels helpless, stranded. He opens and closes the tin, unable to look at its contents. He opens and closes his fists. From a great distance he watches his trembling, over-scrubbed hands fumble the lid off the tin. Okay he says to the hands, OK, but they scramble to close it up again. Her body was tiny when she finally slipped out of it. When he'd gone to collect the ashes, he had thought there must have been a mistake because what they gave him couldn't have filled a coffee jar. But she'd always been a little thing. Where was there room for a tumour? No one knew how her body had hidden it, a growth the size of a clementine. Kept it, kept it secret until it was too late. Why do they always measure cancer by fruit, she'd wanted to know. Why always citrus? Well, orange, you glad it wasn't a grapefruit? It had exhausted him to even think of it, let alone say it out loud. But there was the sound of her laugh, her real laugh, with the huskiness it had acquired since she'd started therapy. They were in her backyard that afternoon, under the loquat tree, the fallen fruit soft and rotting under their shoes. The air was boozy with ferment, and the effects of the chemo weren't yet too visible. She sat in a dining chair, a blue towel draped around her shoulders. It might have been a moment in which to pretend things were otherwise, but she'd seen the other patients around the ward, their hair falling out in great drifts, and decided that wasn't for her. You'll do it? she'd asked. I'm tired of all these strangers touching me. I just don't have the patience for it anymore. I've never really had the patience for anyone else, but now um, I'm excused from pretending. She'd held her hand out for the clippers and adjusted the setting, then handed them back to him. Just give me a number three. It's all going to go anyway. He'd started underneath at her nape, so if she changed her mind, they could rescue it to something less drastic, drastic. But she said straight ahead as the shoulder length tresses of copper blonde fell into the grass around their feet. He was thinking that he should save some, remembering the envelopes of baby curls she had kept, the date and his age in months noted in blue biro. But that kind of keepsaking, keepsaking didn't belong to the deep end of life. It would look morbid, unhopeful, he left the hair where it, where it fell, two inches of pale grey already showing at the roots. Two inches. What did that amount to in weeks? Five or six? 
That was how long ago she'd given up on hair dye. She put her hands up to check his progress, brushing her fingertips over the soft stubble. It's funny, isn't it, she said. It's what I used to give you. He had turned off the clippers, leaving her with a fine silver fuzz that rubbed away over the following weeks until she was a vulnerable, newborn-looking creature, but with sharpened, haunted features. She lived long enough to see it grow back, a darker grey in tight, dense curls. Then something had gotten into her chest, fluid on the lungs, and she didn't have the strength to fight it off. He's late bringing the boat back, the unemptied tin balanced on his knees. As he rows into shore, he can see the blue doors of the boat shed have been pulled shut, the buckets of live bait gone from the jetty. He docks and bangs a few times, open-handed on the side of the shed. Inside there is radio noise, talk at commentary speed, but he can't make out the sport, something from the daylit side of the globe. Then the sound of a bolt sliding and the boatman opens the door, chest hair sprouting from the low neck of his navy singlet. I'm sorry, Christian says. Late. I see that. He looks Christian up and down for the second time that day, his eyes coming to rest on the biscuit tin tucked under Christian's arm, hopeful maybe for the offer of a Monte Carlo. Christian starts to explain, but the man just nods like he's seen it all before, putting it all together, the good shoes, the absence of fishing gear, placing him. The younger man feels more grateful than he'd ever care to admit being placed. How'd you go then? Get everyone home? Christian shakes his head. I owe you extra, he offers. I was out there another hour at least. No, you don't. Not for you and she. You come in here for a tick. He leads Christian into the boat shed, under low hanging bulbs and safety cages and past the rows of upturned boats in hibernation, awaiting trout season. The man doesn't give his name, and Christian doesn't ask it, but he accepts a sweating can of beer and lowers himself into a folding chair. The surrounding walls are lined with shelves, and these are buckling with their load of old manuals and fishing guides, pages crenulated and thickening in the damp, and with rusty souvenirs dredged up from the old town. Some years earlier, a drought sucked half the lake away and the town rose right up out of the mud like a sludgy, shipwormed beast. Former residents returned to tread gingerly across the lake bed, old shoes breaking through the brittle layer baked over the softer, rich mud. From this they unearthed the detritus of their own histories. Things not worth the taking three decades earlier had appreciated down there in the silt, and people fished out bicycle parts, letter boxes, typewriter keys, the iron frame of a piano. Then the rains came back and the town was swallowed again. Here are the photographs and newspaper clippings tacked along the boat shed wall, mildew blooming under the glass frames, the height of the drought, the townspeople picking over the lake bed like prospectors. Her mother, her mother is there among them. Like the rest, she'd put, an old sh put on old shoes and walked out over the cracked mud across the Knot Lake, right up to the empty windows of that too awful house to see if the tables were still set. All she saw, she said, was a room full of rocks. Come on then, the boatman says. Are we going? Are we all set? And Christian hauls, up, hauls himself up from the chair to follow. Outside the air is cool and heavy, the viscosity of water and it can no longer be said where the lake and the night divide, moon slapping boat flank as if to say, go on, go on, go on. Here is a charge now, a change in the air, a resonance, whatever comes after a bell has rung out and the sound has drifted away. Sinkers by Josephine Rowe from here until August. Next week I'll be reading a short story from the Griffith Review.